Good morning. Good morning. Tyler's message this morning is the faith of Jesus. Good morning. I have been building up to this. We've looked at the love of God, that everything that we do and all that we believe has to be based first and foremost on that one principle, the love of God. You must fall in love with Jesus Christ for this Christian, what would be the word, for the power of what Christ promises to actually be real in your life. For that to be real, you must have a loving relationship with Jesus Christ. If you do not, then it's just legalism. Do you understand that? That Christianity only works if you know and love Christ and if He abides in your heart. Now what we're going to talk about this morning is the difference between faith in Jesus and the faith of Jesus. Now listen, John 3.16 says what? That He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish. Right? Believing in Jesus. Is it biblical? Yes. yes. Is it important? Yes. yes. But what I want you to understand is that God, in His mercy, in His wisdom, has raised up the Seventh-day Adventist Church for a specific purpose and reason. Well, that was just... Amen. How many Adventists do we have here? Can you raise your hand? <laughs> do you understand why you're an Adventist? Do you know why God actually raised this denomination up? Yeah. Do you realize we were never supposed to be a denomination? No. That we were raised to be a movement? Yeah. A movement to bring Christ's return? The reason why we're a denomination is because we've lost sight of what we were raised for. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the difference between having faith in Jesus and having the faith of Jesus. So this morning, I'd like to look at some texts, and the first text would be Revelation 12, what, uh, no, I'm sorry, Revelation 14, verse 12, what uh, Ray read. Revelation 14, Revelation 14, verse 12, Ray, do you have that? Yes, sir. Can you read it for me? Yeah. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Now, what is the context that this verse is given? Is there a specific time in history that this text applies to and the people that it's talking to apply to? What time in history would that be? Say it loud. The very end. The very end. So this text applies to those living in the last days, right? Those who are waiting for Jesus to return. Now you say to me, Pastor, Paul was waiting for Jesus to return. He didn't return in his day. Peter was waiting for Jesus to return. He didn't return in his day. Martin Luther was waiting for Jesus to return, and he didn't return in his day. How can you say that Jesus is going to return in our day? Do you have a solid foundation? to base that belief on? One of the greatest foundations is that if you look at the state of the world, unbelievers are looking and saying that this world can't go on much longer. But I want you also to think about Revelation chapter 3. Turn there with me. Revelation chapter 3. If you have headings in your Bible, what are, what's the heading for Revelation chapter 3? The letters to the churches, right? There are seven letters addressed to seven different churches. Is that correct? The last letter is addressed to which church? Do you know? Laodicea. Laodicea, is that right? Is there any letter after that? No. So, as historicists in your understanding of prophecy, these letters weren't 
were not only addressed to specific churches in the day of John, but they also cover specific time periods in the history of the church. Is that right? So if you come to that last church, the church of Laodicea, don't you think that's going to cover the last time period of earth's history? Ray, do you have that text? Yeah. Can you read the description of the church of Laodicea? But before you start, I want you to think about the description that's given here and see if this is not an accurate description of the church today. And this is one of the foundations that you can base that this is the last days, right? You want 14 to 22? Yes, sir. Okay. Can you do that for me? Yep. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou were cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed. And that, they, that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door, and knock. If any man hear my voice, and open the door, I will come into him, and will sup with him, and he with me. To him that overcometh, I will grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. The description that was given, is that an accurate description of the state of the church today? Amen. Do we think we're rich? and in need of nothing, when actually, if we were able to see our condition the way God sees our condition, we are poor, we are blind, we are wretched. Those are hard statements. But listen, you need to understand that Laodicea has a dual meaning. It's the church that's asleep, but it's also the church that overcomes. Did you know that? Is there an eighth church? What? When Jesus comes, what church does he come back for? The church of Laodicea. That church will finally wake up. And it will finally take God's counsel. And it will finally buy what God offers for free. Now listen. Where are we at in the history of this world? Are we in the last days? Do you believe that? Yes. So if we're in the last days, shouldn't there be a generation that Jesus can come back for? Yes. For that generation to happen and to appear, what must they have? They, they must have the faith of Jesus. One of the last things Ray read was that Jesus counsels us to overcome as he overcame. What did he have to overcome? Sin, death, and the devil. Ricky, you said the world. Yeah. And did he overcome the world? Yes. Did he overcome sin? Yes. Why did he have to overcome those things? If you came to our Sabbath school class today, you would know. Jesus had to overcome those things so he could be legally your propitiation, your sacrifice. Where Adam fell, Jesus succeeded. What Adam lost, Jesus regained. And what Jesus overcame, he now gives his church the power to overcome. Why hasn't Jesus come? Because we haven't overcome the way he overcame. 
So let's look at some more text. Turn with me to Romans chapter 10, verses 8 through 14. We already looked at John 3.16. Romans chapter 10. Verses 8 through 14. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be what? So is having faith in Jesus important? What does the word justification mean? Ha ha ha, that's not really quiet. Here's a simple definition of that. Justification being made right with God. Right? Now there's a lot more to it, but listen. This text here talks about justification. If you believe in Christ, you will be saved. Why will you be saved? Because you will have received justification. Now, is there a difference between that faith and having the faith of Christ? Because there's a whole other word that deals with the faith of Christ. And that word starts with an S. Do you know what that word is? Sanctification. Sanctification. Is sanctification important? Right. If we cherish this justification, if we have this faith in Jesus, right, and we cherish this justification, it will birth in and become sanctification. You can't have one without the other. And if you have one, you will have the other. Or at least you should. Sanctification. Let me ask you a question. We are told from the spirit of prophecy that the generation that is alive when Christ comes back has to do a specific work. Do you know what that work is? Say it There is a specific individual work that must be done in the Christian before Christ comes back. Do you know what that work is? That's right. It is something we do not want to hear, nor do we like to hear. It's called the putting away of Sin. Is that right? Is there anybody that actually believes you can actually put away sin? And this is why Jesus hasn't come back. Because we waver and waffle on this statement and on what's being called from us. Now listen. This is specifically for the people who will be alive when Jesus comes back. Do you understand that? So was that for the people in Luther's day? Was that for the people in Paul's day? They laid the foundation that would be built upon and be built upon until that final generation when Jesus comes back. It could have been for them in that day. Right? Okay, but has it happened yet? Did Jesus come back? So yet, we're still waiting for that generation. Now, if you were in the Sabbath school class today and you understand why God gave us the book of Job, and you realize that God allowed these things to happen to Job for what reason? Come on. Some of you guys were in the Sabbath class, right? Okay. To make God relevant to Job and to make Job relevant for God. What is that purpose for? It's for what you said. It is so that the world can see in us Christ and Him crucified, the power of God. Yeah. Right? So God allowed these things to come upon Job. For what reason? To vindicate God. Isn't that what this last generation will be alive? Yeah. Isn't that why God allows them to go through what they're going to go through? It is to vindicate God, His justice and His mercy. But how do you get that generation? It is understanding what the faith of God. Jesus is. Amen. And allowing God to live that out in your life. And you can go back as an example in the Old Testament to the book of Job. I asked Chuck you this question at the end of your class. Was Job a type of Christ? And did Job have to understand the faith 
of Jesus. And you have to ask yourself, how could he? Jesus wasn't even born yet. Did Job know Scripture? Did Job know the God of Scripture? Who was that God of Scripture that Job was praying to? Did Job have to have the faith of Christ to endure what he endured? Now, I'm going to ask you, and I hope somebody can answer, what is the faith of Christ? And I'll give you some examples of it. In the book of Matthew, when Jesus was hanging on the cross, and in the darkest part of him paying the price for my sin, he could not feel the presence of his Father anymore. And he cried out in agony. What did he cry? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why did he make that statement? Why did he cry that cry? Because he took sin upon him, and he who knew no sin became sin. And how does the Father view sin? It's abhorrent to him. Is that right? Is that biblical? Yeah. Now when the father looked at his son and his son became sin, what did the father see? And Jesus cried out, what? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Did he give up hope on the cross at that point? And that's the faith of Jesus. He could not see, as we're told through the spirit of prophecy, through the portals of death, whether he would actually make it through paying the penalty for our sin because sin is so grievous to God. He didn't know if God could ever accept him. Why? Because he who knew no sin became sin. Do you understand what that means? Do you understand the depth of what Jesus did? That he took your sin so you will never have to face hell. Jesus took your hell for you. And he could not feel his Father's presence anymore. There had never been a separation between the Trinity from eternity past to that point. And yet in this one moment in time, God the Son is crying out, Father, where are you? Why have you forsaken me? We have always been one. But he did not give up his faith in his Father. Why? Because he knew the character of his father. He knew his father was love. And he had to trust in that. Even though everything that he felt. Everything that he saw. All the temptation that the devil was pouring upon him. Was telling him something different. Now I want you to think about this. Because in Matthew he says. My God. My God. Why have you forsaken me? But what's the last word Jesus said on the cross? Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. How can he go from saying, my God, my God, to calling him Father? That, brothers and sisters, is the faith of Jesus. And that is the faith that's going to be required of me and you if we're going to be that last generation that's alive when Jesus comes. The question is, is are you afraid to be a part of that generation? Because that's what I mostly hear from Adventists. God, I don't want to live through the time of trouble. <clears throat> I used to think that way until I started to grasp and understand the privilege that it would be to be that generation. Amen? Amen? Amen. amen? amen. Are you sure? Because yes. a lot of us say amen, but we're thinking, God put me in the grave. <laughs> Resurrection. Listen. Do you understand what kind of privilege that would be to be alive when Jesus comes? I mean, God trusts you so much. And He has made the character of His Son 100% perfectly remade in you. So that when the world sees you, they don't see you, they see Christ. Christ in me, the hope of glory, the faith of Jesus. But how does that happen? It can only happen if you have a living, 
freezing relationship with Jesus Christ. It only happens if you understand what righteousness by faith truly is. Only happens if you are a student of God's Word and you have that Word actively living inside of you that the Spirit brings to your memory and allows you in the darkest of days to hold on to your faith in Jesus Christ. Listen. Some of us go through some very hard things. Sometimes tragedy hits us and we look and we go, I don't understand why God is doing this to us. But are we alone in that? Are we the only ones who have ever had to face those situations? How many of you would like to be Job? How many of you would like to have God say, hey, have you noticed my servant Max? Mm. Or as Chuck brought out, have you focused on my servant Max? Now listen, before Jesus comes back, the devil is going to be focusing on God's remnant people. Is that right? Oh, yes. And he is going to pour out all of his wrath <laughs> and all of his anger and all of his evil upon God's people. Why? Because it's finally going to come the time of his ex. I didn't do that. <laughs> I might have done that. As long as the devil can keep the church of Laodicea sleeping, then his probation continues to just expand. Okay? And his life is not in danger of ending. And that's what he wants, right? So, two things. Sleeping in confusion. And if he can keep us asleep and keep us confused, then he'll prolong his life. But when the church, when God's people finally get their act together because they no longer are looking at each other, but they're looking at him. When they're no longer arguing about this and that, but they're actually taking what the Word of God says and allowing it to live in their lives. Then you're going to see the devil get very upset with God's church and God's friendly people. And then you will know because of that, that you're at the right place, at the right time, right where God wants you. And where is that? In God's hand. And what does the Bible say? If you're in God's hand, who can snatch you out? No one. Is that good news? All right. So, turn with me to... Uh, back to Revelation 3, verse 21. Read, uh, read it. Let's read it again. Revelation 3, 21. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my Father on his throne. What you need to understand about these seven letters to the seven churches is as I told you, they cover specific time periods in the history of the church. So what was given to the first church was specific to that church of that day and also for that time period. Is the letter to the Laodiceans the last letter given? It is for the last people who will stand before Christ comes. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Jesus has a special and peculiar message for us, and that is that we overcome the same way He overcame. How do we do that? Turn to... Well, you're still in... Well, turn to Revelation chapter 14. Adventists should know this chapter very well. What's contained in Revelation chapter 14? And not just the third, but the first and second as well. The three angels' messages. Isn't that why this church was raised up to proclaim... The three angels' messages? Yes. Has the first message been proclaimed? Yes. Has the second angel's message been proclaimed? Yes. The third angel's message? Has it been proclaimed? I got one man here shaking his head because he knows. Yes. Yes. That message has been proclaimed. What is the third angel's message in verity? 
Justification by faith. The righteousness of Christ. Justification by faith. A faith that will change you from a sinner who can't be, uh, what would be the word? Who, who the world can't tell you from any other sinner in the world. And that's pretty much the state of the churches today. This is why we don't suffer persecution here because we haven't actually done anything to make the world hate us. Okay, now, right before Christ comes back, will that change? Why will that change? Because Christ's people will actually magnify His character and the world will hate that. And the world will turn its attention to us. This is what we want. Do you understand that? This is what we want. Can you say amen to that? Amen. This is why Christ hasn't come, because we really don't want that. We, we don't want that. I, I want to continue to go to my job. I want to see my kids grow. I want to see my daughter get married. I want to have grandkids. Uh, there's a thousand things. What I've learned through decades of being a part of this church is that I want to be a part of that generation that sees Jesus comes back. I want to be able to be like Job and say, yea, though he slays me, yet will I trust him. I want to be able to say with Jesus that I was able to overcome the same way he overcame. I want to have Jesus living out his life in me. I want to be a perfect representation of his character to this world. That can only happen if we go from the church that's sleeping to the church that overcomes. If we finally wake up and buy that gold tried in the fire, if we finally take on that white raiment, if we finally take that ice out so that we can see clearly where we're at, who we are, and what God has called us for. So Revelation chapter 14 states, let's look at verse... 6 all the way through 12. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth. To who? Every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Jesus said, look, if you want to know the one thing to keep looking at and looking for to gauge the closeness of my coming, what is it? Is it wars and rumors of wars? No. Is it what the Pope says? No. It is... The spreading of the gospel to every nation, kindred, tribe, tongue. Right? How close are we to having the gospel spread to the entire earth? Right? Right? So listen. To preach to those who dwell on the earth, what are we supposed to preach? The everlasting gospel. I never understood this when I first started to hear it, but I understand it now. And that is, how many gospels are being preached today in the name of Christ? Okay? How many gospels are being preached in the Evans Church? What are we called to preach? The everlasting gospel. And that is the gospel of salvation through Christ power to overcome through Christ through Christ, and the power to be victorious and to be able to stand before God without a mediator. That will only happen through the gospel of Christ, the everlasting gospel. Amen? Amen. Saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to Him for the hour of His judgment. What? Yes. Yes. And worship Him.